Let folly praise, but fancy loves. I praise and love the child whose heart no thought, whose tongue no word, whose hand no deed defiled. I praise him most, I love him best. Oh, praise and love is his, while him I love, in him I live and cannot live amiss. Love's sweetest mark, land's highest theme, man's most desired light. To love him life, to leave him death, to live in him delight. He mine by gift, I his by debt, the siege to other due. First friend he was, best friend he is, all times will try him true. Though young yet wise, though small yet strong, though man yet God he is, as wise he knows, as strong he can, as God he loves to bless. His In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My Mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My Mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy, my mother. Preserve me this night from mortal sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Today is the 16th of January. It's the feast of St. Marcellus, the, the Pope and martyr. But it's also, uh, as, as we see every day, a commemoration of many other holy saints. And particularly noteworthy in the uh, martyrology today is the first five martyrs of the Franciscan order. At Morocco in Africa, the martyrdom of the five proto-martyrs of the Order of Friars Minor. Berard, Peter, and Otto, who were priests, and Acursius and Ayutus, who were lay brothers, for preaching the Catholic faith, and because of their hatred of the Mohammedan law, after various torments and mockeries by the Saracen king, they were beheaded. And one other to mention, because we'll speak about him today, at Arles in France, Saint Honoratus, bishop and confessor, whose life was renowned for learning and for miracles. And also in our congregation today, as we keep mentioning the sort of the daily uh, focus, if you will, we consecrate the the day too. In uh, today for as S Saturday is in honor of the Most Blessed Virgin Mary, and Sunday tomorrow we keep in honor of all our holy patrons. So, a warm welcome to you uh, to this broadcast tonight, from wherever you are. The, the saint I just mentioned, Saint Honoratus, who we'll be speaking of tonight, Saint Hilary says of him that uh, he lived on, on an island like us, but that he's full of charity. He described him as saying he had his arms stretched out uh, constantly stretched out to invite all Christians to come and to rest in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that, I love that line because it shows really how, what, we, what we're aiming to do, both in this broadcast and just as, as Christians, as Catholics, that in our own per imperfect way, we have to reach out to one another and not to try to take from each other, or to take advantage of each other, or even to have some worldly motive, or it's not necessarily bad, but just but to have that highest pure motive, to invite one another to come and to rest in the love of Jesus Christ, which is what our hearts are made for. And this is the same thing which our Lord cries out to us. He, he says in the scriptures, abide in my love. And so let us hear him. Um, may, may these live streams be to all of us, to both you and to me, that, that reminder to abide in his love. And we had an encouraging uh, letter just recently of someone writing to us from America, and who, it's, it's, I'm very glad to hear how, if you're listening here, how this, these things have helped you. I hope you continue to grow in your spiritual life. So for all of our encouragement. Hello. First, a thank you, since I'm really grateful to have you to pray with daily in your live broadcast. It is a great support to me spiritually, and I actually order my daily schedule around praying with you. Such a blessing, and I don't feel worthy. I began saying the three Hail Marys twice daily this year, and that has changed my life. Also, I've already experienced the power of devotion to our Mother of Perpetual Succor, which I had never directly experienced before, until I called upon her in a time of true need this year, and she answered my prayer with such strength and swiftness that the problem disappeared right away. I also am now devoted to St. Alphonsus in a way I never imagined. If you are fishing for souls, you have caught one here, in me, definitely. No turning back for me now. What a wealth of wisdom in the writings of St. Alphonsus. And at the end, thank you again, and Merry Christmas to you all. Well, thank you. Very encouraging letter. Beautiful to hear. As we, we know that our Mother Perpetual Sucker is, is called that because she perpetually helps us. She's always there, just waiting for us to pray to her. But it's, it's always a confirmation of our faith when you hear these these little anecdotes of that she does hear our prayers, that she does answer them. Maybe not always in the way we want them to be answered, but she does hear them and she does answer them. So, thank you for that, le that letter. And speaking of Our Lady, that's the next notice here. 
continuing on our readings from the glories of Mary by our Holy Father St. Alphonsus. And uh, as we said before, we're looking at the first part on the Hail Holy Queen, particularly Our Lady's title as Mother of Mercy. And now, if Mary is so good to all, even to the ungrateful and negligent, who love her but little, and seldom have recourse to her, how much more loving will she be to those who love her and often call upon her? She is easily found by them that seek her. Oh, how easy, as the same blessed Albert, is it for those who love Mary to find her, and to find her full of compassion and love. In the words of the book of Proverbs, I love them that love me. She protests that she cannot do otherwise than love those who love her. And although this most loving lady loves all men as her children, yet, says St. Bernard, she recognizes and loves, that is, she loves in a more special manner, those who love her more tenderly. Blessed Raymond Giordano asserts that these happy lovers of Mary are not only loved, but even served by her. For he says that those who find the most blessed Virgin Mary find all. For she loves those who love her. Nay, more, she serves those who serve her. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And, lucky us, because it's Saturday, we continue to have uh, the second notice from the glories of Mary again, but this time looking at her principal feasts and continuing on our, our Holy Father St. Alphonsus's exposition on the Immaculate Conception. I may here add that as God could grant Eve the grace to come immaculate into the world, could he not then grant the same favor to Mary? Yes, indeed. God could do it and did it. For in every account, it was becoming, as the same St. Anselm says, that this virgin, on whom the Eternal Father intended to bestow his only begotten Son, should be adorned with such purity as not only to exceed that of all men and angels, but exceeding any purity that can be conceived after that of God. And St. John Damascene speaks in still clearer terms, for he says that our Lord had preserved the soul together with the body of the Blessed Virgin, in that purity which became her who was to receive a God into her womb. For as he is holy, he only reposes in holy places. And thus the Eternal Father could well say to his beloved daughter, As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. My daughter, amongst all my other daughters, Thou art as a lily in the midst of thorns, for they are all stained with sin, but thou wast always immaculate and always my beloved. In the second place, it was becoming that the Son should preserve Mary from sin as being his mother. No man can choose his mother, but should such a thing ever be granted to anyone, who is there who if able to choose a queen, would wish for a slave. If able to choose a noble lady, would he wish for a servant? Or if able to choose a friend of God, would he wish for his enemy? If then the Son of God alone could choose a mother according to his own heart, his own liking, we must consider, as a matter of course, that he chose one becoming a god. St. Bernard says that the creator of men becoming man must have selected himself a mother whom he knew became him. 
And as it was becoming that a most pure God should have a, should have a mother pure from all sin, he created her spotless. St. Bernardine of Siena, speaking of the different degrees of sanctification, says that the third is that obtained by becoming the mother of God, and that this sanctification consists in the entire removal of original sin. This is what took place in the Blessed Virgin. Truly God created Mary such, both as to the eminence of her nature and the perfection of grace with which he endowed her, as became him who was to be born of her. Here we may apply the words of the Apostle to the Hebrews, for it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. A learned author observes that according to St. Paul, it was fitting that our blessed Redeemer should not only be separated from sin, but also from sinners, according to the explanation of St. Thomas who says that it was necessary that he who came to take away sins should be separated from sinners as to the fault under which Adam lay. But how could Jesus Christ be said to be separated from sinners if he had a mother who was a sinner? All very reasonable points. As soon as you hear it, you just think, of course. But there's a line here that I'd like to focus on, that when he quotes the scriptures here from uh, Canticles, chapter 2, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And I think this, the use of this verse helps to see very clearly the, the just immense love that our Lord has for his mother. Because who is he calling thorns? Who is he comparing to thorns? He says amongst the daughters, amongst those who he considers as his children, those he loves. And you see in the lives of the saints how just tremendously in love, so to speak, to use a modern term, how tremendously in love he is with them. He's, he's besotted almost with, those, with these saints that he loves. With St. Teresa of Avila, you see him just giving her grace after grace, and he, he, he sends the seraphim to transpierce her heart, and it, I'm pretty sure it was to St. Teresa that he says uh, that I, I, would have, if, I would create heaven for you alone if it did not already exist. And so much he loves her. With St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, there's a thing in her life where if, if you see, she's always going into ecstasies of love. God's always just completely showing her, showing how much he loves her. And he, she says at one point, My Jesus, thou lovest us even to... Yeah, I'm, trying to remember, I'm not sure which word she but it's like inebriation. You just completely to foolishness. She, she accuses our Lord of being foolish. And you see it in many other ways. He's, he says to various saints that he, he can't refuse them anything he, they ask. What, what further proof of love could you ask from God who can, who can do anything? And he tells them, no matter what you ask, I will grant it, because their wills were so united with his. That love was so perfect, really, between them. And yet, with all that, they're still compared to the thorns, which prick and cause pain, even though he was, he was foolish for love of them. And so it shows, uh, in, a, in a more stark light, the absolutely immense love he has for his mother. If, they are, if they're like thorns, she's the lily among thorns. You see a lily among thorns, see? You want to reach in, don't touch the thorns, but you, you're just entranced by the beauty of this lily. And so, if he loved her so much, it's that much greater a proof that he would create her as perfectly as possible. And of course he has the power to create her without the stain of original sin. As I said at the beginning of the reading, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, very clear, short comparison that he created Eve without sin, 
So surely he, can, he would create his mother without sin. And he did. He created her immaculate. What a wonderful privilege for our Blessed Mother. O oh Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us. And now, before we go to our main notice, just to renew, re review the order of the broadcast, uh, after these notices we have the Holy Rosary, and then uh, after the Rosary, but before Holy Mass, we do the, the prayers against Satan, the Apostate Spirits, and St. Patrick's Breastplate. Then the Holy Mass, which tonight is that of our Mother Perpetual Succor. Now that we're out of uh, Christmas time, we have the privilege of, well, just generally all year round, we have the privilege of every Saturday offering the votive Mass, our Mother Perpetual Succor. So we do that uh, with, the, with the commemoration of St. Marcellus. And then after Mass, we'll have Thanksgiving for Holy Communion and then get into devotions. So as usual, we'll start devotions with the St. Angelus. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, we're doing this prayer, or this, this devotion called the, Salt, the Psalter of Jesus. And it's divided into 15 parts, 15 petitions, rather three parts of 15 petitions. And so we don't have time to do them all in one day, so we've been splitting up. And yesterday we did the second part of the petition 6 through 10, and tomorrow we'll finish the devotion doing the third part, petitions 11 through 15. Then we'll pray the litany of Our Lady. If there's time, I'd like to, to sing it. And then we'll finish, as usual, with night prayers. And then, because it's Saturday night, we can do the sung, solemn, alma redemptoris mater, which we offer for the relief of the souls in purgatory, offering both our the prayer and, and our singing, uh, that God would have mercy on them. So those are devotions for tonight. There's a, a story which is very nice, connected with St. Honoratus, with our congregation here. Just a little thing, but you'll see what I mean. But before I get into it, I'll get a little bit of background. We do, uh, we have yearly patrons in the monastery. We each get a patron, which uh, can change each year. And so on, on New Year's Eve, we all get together, we pray the Veni Sancti Spiritus, and, uh, and then we, we nominate various saints to be annual annual patrons and then it's it's just chosen from a hat or a bowl or whatever and that in the holy ghost we hope we'll choose the one that we need to, to kind of protect us for that year and practically speaking what it affects us in the sense that every night and every morning we say a our father and hail mary in honor of our patron saint of that year and so that leads into the story. There was uh, one of my confers at seminary, and there was a, uh, another seminarian there who had a book. It was a book of prayers or of lives, lives of the saints, something like that. And he, he flipped it open, and it happened to fall on the page of St. Honoratus, the saint of today. Or it's St. Marcellus today, but he's in the, in the martyrology. He died on, on today. And... He'd never heard of the saint, which many people have not. He's, he's fairly obscure nowadays. And he, he kind of laughed and said, oh, I wonder who's praying to St. Saint, saint Honoratus nowadays. And my comfort was there, and he happened to have St. Honoratus as his patron that year, because we, we are devoted to him. And he said, oh, well, I prayed him twice a day. <laughs> Is, I, I, we prayed the, the Padre and the Ave with his arms in the form of a cross every morning, every night, in honor of St. Honoratus that year. And the other seminarian said, oh, I guess I better take my foot out of my mouth. Anyway, nice story. And uh, to the honor of St. Honoratus. But it's true that he is, he is fairly obscure amongst uh, most, even most Catholics nowadays. But it's not, it certainly wasn't that way in his, in his lifetime. He was uh, quite renowned in his life, and one of the biographers said that his name cannot be forgotten, for it is linked with the monastery of Laurent, which is an island in, uh, off the coast of southern France. He's linked with that monastery, which sent forth its sons as bishops, theologians, and saints to spread the knowledge of the gospel far beyond the boundaries of Gaul. And his name is not only linked 
with the monastery of, of Laurent, but um, completely tied up with it because he's, he's the founder. When he first went to the island of Laurent, it was uninhabited and infested by snakes. And it's described as squalid, uh, deserted, and inaccessible. But he was already famous for holiness and his fame simply spread. And so disciples ca came to him from all, from all corners. St. Hilary, uh, one of the, his uh, disciples and a great um, eulogizer of him, said, what nation does not have its citizens in that monastery? And so although came, when he came to it, it was just inaccessible, completely desolate, it, was, it, it flourished tremendously as a center of, of sanctity, of learning, uh, and of a sort of refuge in, the, in that dark time of the world. And so Cesarius, who also was a great monk and scholar, within a few decades he was able to say, Fortunate Isles of Laurent. There's, there were two islands nearby. His sister had a monastery on another one. Thou art small and flat to look upon, and yet thou hast raised to heaven numberless mountains. It is thou that dost nourish perfect monks, that sendest illustrious prelates into all countries. For all those whom thy beneficent shelter receives, that us raise upon the wings of love and humility to the highest virtue. And so St. Eucarius of Lyon, another uh, great doctor and uh, bishop and monk of that time, he had been a personal disciple of St. Honoratus. He said that he was the master of bishops and a doctor of the churches. And so in this way, he's really comparable with St. Columba, uh, who we venerate as our, as our Holy Father here in the monastery after St. Alphonsus, our Holy Father, because he was, he also came uh, to the island of Iona, off the coast of Scotland, and it was from there that the Picts were converted. The, the, it's an amazing story, really, when you read it, because if you know about Hadrian's Wall, the Romans, the immense, almost unimaginably powerful empire, They'd spread all over the known world, and yet the Picts up there in the north of Scotland, they were so savage and powerful that it, the Romans just decided it wasn't worth it. They, they tried and failed to conquer them, and so they just built this wall to keep them out. And yet those Picts were converted by God's help by St. Columba and his monks. It's a fantastic story. And so the, the church of, of northern Scotland was really Columban. It was it was monastic actually. They had it eventually developed into normal diocese, but at first it was really uh, m monasteries that governed the, the Christians that were converted there. And so it's similar to Saint Columba because so many bishops and missionaries came from the Isle of Iona, from the monastery there founded by Saint Columba, and so it's very similar to Saint Honoratus. So many of the the bishops and saints of that time came out and. Uh, spread the gospel not only in, in France but beyond. If we have time, well, we won't have time, but I'll just mention briefly that St. Patrick spent some time in Laurent, is believed. There's a there's an engraving of, of him commemorating his visit over one of the ancient doorways there. And he had already received tonsure as a monk in another monastery in France, whose name is, escapes me right now. I think it's anyway. Uh, and they had gone to, to Britain to prepare to go to Ireland, but a dream prompted him more or less to go back to, to France, and it's thought that he was at uh, the Monastery of Laurent, in which he uh, spent some time in preparation for his, his great takeover, if you will, of, of Ireland, uh, and then other missionaries as well, anyway, before going into that. So it's a, it's a great center, really, which before St. Honoratus got there, was, as we saw, desolate and uninhabited. And so he's certainly comparable to St. Columba, although uh, less renowned nowadays. And also to St. Enda, uh, another one who should be renowned, but unfortunately is not. But he was called in his time the Son of the West, S-U-N, because he, he had such a tremendous effect upon uh, the monastic life when it had died out in so many other places uh, it flourished in his in his monastery there, 
on, off the west coast of, of Ireland. So he was called the, the Son of the West. And again, the gospel was nourished there and spread out. So St. Honoros was great. Uh, it was easily comparable to him as well. But I think the best portrait of St. Honoratus is given by St. Hilary, his disciple and friend. And his, he was also a bishop. He succeeded him there in the bishopric of Arles. And he says, If Charity desired to have her portrait painted, she would borrow the features of Honoratus. There's a nice story from his youth, just shortly after his conversion, before he became a monk. It shows this, this tender charity of his heart. He was tired and hungry and about to eat, when on, a sudden, when on a sudden there came to him a leper full of sores. The young Christian ran towards him, tenderly embraced him, took him to his chamber and offered him his food. And as he washed the leper's hands, the face immediately shone bright as the sun, and Honoratus recognized in it the face of Jesus. And I think this is really the, the secret of his attraction for men and why men flock to him from every nation. This overflowing charity, as, as we saw earlier, I quoted earlier in the, in the broadcast of St. Hilary saying that his arms were outstretched to all Christians, telling them to come and rest in the love of Jesus Christ. And so this great charity is, is a, a, a model for us. And I'm, I'm sure about that this is going, going over in time, so I won't, I won't go too much longer, but just to speak briefly on, on the connection, particularly that we have with him. And it really is through prayer. And so the, the idea of, of he got all these graces, this great charity, because of his continual prayer. It was said of him that he implored the assistance of God with continual prayer. And he, had, he, was, he was connected with St. John Cassin. Uh, one of the biographers of Cassin says, The most blessed Cassin, who in the monastery of Laurent has as his compere the blessed Honoratus. Cassin may or may not have actually spent time in the monastery of Laurent, but he, he certainly founded his monastery of St. Vincent there in the, in the south of France, very close to where Laurent is where he had 5,000 monks. And Cassin is the one, St. Saint, Saint John Cassin, who brought uh, this, this tradition to Western Europe of constantly praying the Deus Nagutorium, which we mentioned yesterday from St. Macarius, who also taught it to his, his, uh, his monks, to pray always in short prayers but with much fervor. Incline unto my aid, O God. O Lord, make haste to help me. And we see it. Uh, it was widespread in the early church. Unfortunately, now it's, it's not used much as a continual prayer, but we want to certainly encourage everyone to use it because it applies to so many situations everywhere we need help to cry to God, incline unto my aid, O God. O Lord, make haste to help me. Deus in adjutorium meum intende. Domine, ad adjuvandum me festina. Use that holy name, Domine. Referring to the holy name of God. Anyhow, so he, St. Honoratus, no doubt, learned this prayer from St. John Cassian and St. Patrick, which I have good reason to be there, believe he was there, would, we don't have a, a, a paper trail, so to speak, that, that says that he took it to Ireland, but we have Irish saints that did pray this over and over again, this prayer, Deus in Adjutorium Meum Intende. And particularly for us who, here in the Orkney Islands, which were, which were evangelized by the monks of St. Columba, we know that St. Columba's immediate uh, successor, St. Bathan, he was the second abbot of Iona, he was very much given to this prayer. He would only eat every few days, but when he did eat, it is, it's related that between he would keep one hand in the, in the air, praying to God, and as he took a, mouth, a mouthful, between every second bite, he would pray, Deus in adjutorium me mentende, Domine ad adjuvandum me festina. Where did he get this? I think it's... A, it's it's certainly not a, a stretch to say that he got it from the Irish tradition. Iona was very was populated. He was Irish. It was populated at first almost entirely by Irish monks, and uh, no doubt they got that from from Saint Patrick, who we have good reason to think got it from Laurent, who got it from Saint John Cassian. So Saint Saint Anoratus is part of this 
wonderful tradition of this continual prayer. And so when we see that he's, he is, St. Honoratus is so inflamed with this divine charity, well, we know that charity comes only by grace. It's completely a divine gift of grace. And grace is promised to those who pray. Our Lord says, ask and it shall be given you. So let us follow the example here of, of St. Honoratus and the many saints that walked in the same tradition of praying continually to God to give us this divine grace of holy charity by which we will get to heaven and hopefully draw many others to heaven. So we may rest there in the love of Jesus Christ. O oh Mary, Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll have the Holy Rosary in a couple of minutes.